Hello and welcome to Portfolio Matters Weekly Update Week 96. But before we get into it, Richard will read the disclaimer. Thank you, Keith. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have a financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. What have we got this week, Keith? Another packed week, Richard. But first of all, some housekeeping. Reminder, pub night is on Monday the 19th of December at the Princess Louise pub in High Hoban. And I've already had an email from somebody in Cheshire who's going to be coming down by train. So (coughs) hope to see you there. Okay, this week's news. Well, we have had unrest in China as COVID lockdowns continue. We've got some charts coming up showing you that COVID cases in China are rising and Although there have been intimations about them easing COVID lockdown policy, right now that's not happening. And so that is very negative for the outlook for the Chinese economy. Christine Lagarde gave a speech in which she made it clear that the ECB is not done raising rates. Elsewhere, BlockFi became the latest crypto casualty, but the big news in the week was Jerome Powell gave a speech in which he indicated that the Fed would now begin to slow the pace of interest rate rises. And so we're now expecting a 50 basis point rise in December rather than 75 basis points. We have a section on that coming up. The EU has agreed a preliminary deal amongst the member states in which they will put a $60 price cap on Russian oil. Whether that will work or not is very much open to debate. And finally, Blackstone have gated their 125 billion US real estate investment trust as they've faced a large number of redemption requests. And frankly, we're expecting financial sector stress to get worse. And this is a sign of that. So Christine Lagarde gave a speech during the week in which she made it clear that Eurozone interest rates would need to continue rising. And here's why. Dark brown line is Eurozone inflation. And although it it has ticked down last month, it's still way above target and higher than they were forecasting in September. So Eurozone monetary policy is incredibly lax and accommodative and needs to rise. Now, in China, lockdowns are having a bad effect on the economy. And this is subway trips in various cities in China. And you can see they've fallen off a cliff in October and November. And this is COVID cases on mainland China, and that is not a good-looking trend, although the absolute numbers are quite low, and do we believe them? This chart shows the number of cities in full or partial lockdown in China and the percentage of GDP impacted by lockdowns is around 25%. And the other news in the week was that we had more details of the Ghana default. And these are countries that the Council for Foreign Relations in the US lists as the top 10 default risks. And of the top 10, we have had three defaults already this year. So Ghana and Sri Lanka have defaulted, as has Russia. You remember that Russia was forced into a technical default back in June because they were unable to pay the interest on their bonds because of U.S. sanctions. Okay, on to this week's economic data, and there's a lot of it. So 
I'm not going to go through it all. If you want to see all the data, please pause and read. Now, in the Eurozone, the big news was that we had November inflation data and that eased. So it was forecast at 10.3. It was better than that. It came at 10.0 down from October. And is that a sign that inflation in the Eurozone is peaking from very high levels? Month on month, we had deflation. So month on month number was expected 0.2. It came in at minus 0.1, well down on plus 1.5 in October. Core Eurozone CPI was slightly higher than expectations, unchanged at 5% from October. So the headline number fell. Core was stable, unchanged on October. In China, we had various PMIs and they were all bad. So all of them were worse than expectations and all of them were down from October. Pause, take a look. So the data, the PMI data depicts a Chinese economy which is being badly affected by lockdowns, unsurprisingly. Now, on to the US, where we had a lot of data. So we had the JOLTS job opening numbers, and they fell to 10.33 in October, down from September, and slightly below expectations. Although, depending on which source you take, expectations were either 10.3, 10.4. So they were towards the bottom end of expectations. The quit rate also was worse than expected at 4.03 million, down slightly from September. We had pending home sales, and they were very disappointing, as we have been forecasting. So year on year, pending home sales are down 37%, well below expectations and down on September. Month on month, they also fell more than expected. We then had the ISM manufacturing PMIs, and these were all bad. So the headline PMI was expected at 50. It came in at 49, which was well below October's 50.2. Prices paid fell to 43, below expectations, and well down on October. And that is good news. So goods price inflation is falling. And finally, we had the Case-Shiller house price index, which also missed expectations. And in September, month on month, it fell 1.5%, which was below expectations. Later today, we have US non-farm payrolls. We also had some quarterly data. So US GDP in Q3 came in at 2.9% which was above expectations. And reminder, in the first two quarters of the year, we had negative GDP growth. So there's a significant pickup in activity in Q3. We also had the GDP price index measure of inflation for Q3, and that came in hot. That came in at 4.3%, above expectations, but well down on Q2. Corporate profits... Very interesting number, much worse than expected. In Q3, corporate op profits fell by 0.2% when they were expected to rise by 3.1%. And that was well down on Q2. And finally, we had PCE inflation, quarterly data, and that's not very reassuring. That came in hot. So it was expected at 4.2%, came in at 4.3%, and the core PCE inflation was expected at 4.5%, it came in at 46 So if Jerome Powell is looking at that data, and we know PCE, or personal consumption expenditure, is the Fed's preferred measure of expenditure, then he's not going to be inclined to, to slow down the pace of rate rises. Richard, do you have any comments? Thank you, Keith. 
I read an interesting article this morning um, about Jerome Powell's comments. And uh, one of the things he pointed out was that the um, participation rate, labor force participation rate in the US is still low relative to where it was pre-COVID. And a great deal of that appears to be a consequence of people taking early retirement, with the theory being that they, get, they can afford to take early retirement because of the housing uh, increase in house prices and increase in the stock market. So in order to manage the uh, supply side of inflation, <clears throat> they need to get the labor force participation rate up. And one way to do that is to squeeze these early retirees by seeing house prices and the stock market drop. And the, the thesis that this guy was putting forward was that that is the Fed's intention. It is to see the stock market fall. It is to see the housing market fall. And it is to drive people back into the employment market. Well, in which case, Richard, his speech on Wednesday was self-defeating because he, afterwards the S&P 500 shot up by 3%. It did. But of course, he's maybe looking, I mean, he will be looking over what over the next six to 12 months. Mm. And I thought it was an interesting thesis because what it means is that the um, he may be saying one thing, but actually intending to do another thing. And the other point mm. this guy made is that the algos that drive the sort of immediate movements look for certain keywords and uh, they don't look for contextual phraseology. You know. uh, so but I thought it was an interesting thesis because clearly it would make sense to do that. No, absolutely. Which coincides with my view of where the stock market is going to go, which is down. Well, a bit. Down, really yeah, down. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, we've got a lot of charts which <clears throat> um, reinforce that view. Anyway, onto the charts, Richard. Oh, US, sorry, UK consumer uh, credit is actually starting to fall. It's an interesting chart, isn't it? Showing that um, consumer credit in the UK is dropping, which means people are borrowing less on their credit cards. And UK mortgage lending is also falling, which means people are paying off their mortgages and not taking out new mortgages, in essence. Yeah, and, I, uh, I was struck by actually how small the fall is compared to, you know, given we've got very high interest rates and very high house prices, you would expect the number of mortgages to have fallen off a cliff. But actually, yeah. we're just kind of at the current levels. I realize they've fallen, but they're at a fairly decent level. Yeah, I mean, it may be that this is a cumulative process and we've got further to go, of course. Yeah. Uh, mortgage approvals, have actually, they've been falling steadily, haven't they? They're, they're actually 40% down from where they were in mid-2020, well, late 2020, which is quite a chunky drop. Mm. Although only back down to where, where it was previously for the last uh, the two years prior to COVID. Uh, EU, EU economic sentiment is still really low um in comparison to where it has been but not as low as it could be uh, i think you know it's it's not a definitive chart this is it it's shown that it's dropped significantly it's not saying it doesn't give an indication as to uh whether it's likely to continue falling at this at the moment i suspect you e e economic sentiment will drop when we start when we have our first cold spell yeah well <clears throat> i'm actually astonished it's as high as this yeah because you know we're only we're above 2012 levels in Europe, according yeah. to the, this particular measure from the EU itself. Well, I would agree. And EU industrial sentiment is really you know it's neutral, isn't it? Pretty much. Yeah, that it's just seems way too high to me. Yeah, and the EU services sentiment is, is still slightly above neutral, and really it is pretty much within its 20-year range. Yeah. Unlike EU consumer confidence, which is really, really low. Obviously, it's had a bit of a boost over the last uh, short period, but I think we have to wait and see what happens mm. for saying that it's out. we're out of the woods there. And EU consumer inflation expectations have dropped really fast and hard, whereas EU CPI year on year hasn't, although yeah. there's going to be things like chunky oil price rises coming out of that shortly. And the EU month on month CPI, as Keith said, is actually fallen below zero. And of course, CPI hasn't shown a drop as yet. EU GDP, which is deflated, as we discussed last year, last week even, um, is uh, showing annualized 2.9% growth in the last quarter. Still growing. And US pending home sales are still dropping, but not as fast as they dropped last month. Mm. But those are big drops month yeah. on month. They Cumulatively, are. that's a lot. 
Yeah. And US pending home sales really are, are dropping very, very fast indeed. The US PCE inflation showing significant drop, almost back down into the sort of range it has been in the last 20 years. So, sorry, Richard. So, this is quarterly data, but we also had monthly data. And I'm not sure exactly how they calculate the difference between the two, but they are four, actually they? showing slightly, you know, markedly different pictures. They are. Uh, US core PCE inflation is started to show, I think, starting to seriously show a general downward trend. But again, that's the quarterly data, and this is the monthly data, and the both the level yeah. and the trends are different. They don't even finish at the same point, do they? Yeah. Uh, US ISM manufacturing PMI is now below 50, which indicates contraction. So US ISM manufacturing prices pay dropping pretty quickly, showing that the, there is less much less inflation and pressure in the pipeline. And US manufacturing new orders are showing continual steady decline, really. US manufacturing employment is uh, below 50, which shows it's contracting, and job openings continuing to fall. And uh, this is querying the JOLT survey. The response so the rate to the JOLTS survey has collapsed post-COVID. So in fact, it's half. So um, we're getting less, in fact, less than half the number of uh, responders in this survey, which suggests that it is probably less accurate than it was. And also whether there's a uh, ascertainment bias going on there, which which is skewing the figures. And the uh, quits rate is also is dropping. It shows people wanting to stay in their jobs a little bit longer, a little bit more nervous about the employment market. Case Shiller house price index year on year still at 10%, but it's dropped dramatically from 20% year on year rise. And the 30 year mortgage rate has fallen off a bit, down to 6.5% over the last few weeks. Yeah, you know, you were talking earlier about Jerome Powell trying to get house prices down. Well, if you just talked up the prospects for you know, US rates being higher for longer, which was also included in his speech, then, you know, 30 year mortgage rates might not have come off as much, which would have uh, better achieved his aims, I think. It would. I agree. So the personal savings rate in the US is the lowest ever recorded. And you'll, you know that we have spoken before about this issue of um, excess saving because of the pandemic largesse of governments. Um, what this, I think, what this suggests is that the excess savings are nicely in, uh, situated in relatively well-off families and that the people who um, who are less well-off simply can't save anymore and aren't saving. I suspect mm. that we, it, we're seeing quite a big skew in that um, in that sort of the, the way the savings are, are, are um, distributed to the population. I should also say, though, Richard, this is the flow data, so it's the savings rate as opposed to the yeah. stock of savings. Yeah. Uh, Chinese manufacturing PMI is also a very gentle downward path. Mm. And non-manufacturing PMI is on a oh, it's sort of oscillating, really, isn't it? It's hard to know where it's going. We, just, can, we, yeah. can, we, we can think we know where it's going. Yeah. But it's hard to know in the data where it's going. Well, it's frankly, do how much do we believe this data, frankly? Well, not very, is it? I think yeah. it's not the case. The Chinese general PMI, which shows that China is a in a mild contraction, despite having 25% of its GDP affected by COVID lockdown. Mm. So uh, EU inflation fell in November, may have peaked. The EU uh, economic forecasters have drawn a new line uh, at uh, 130 degrees to the existing one, which shows that it will be back at 2% in about seven months' time. Uh, US PC inflation fell quarterly and monthly basis. I mean, it does look as if US inflation has peaked, as Keith was saying last week. Uh, US manufacturing PMI is missed. It suggests the US economy is continuing to slow down. But job openings fell slightly, and the job to the market remains tight. And US home sales fell further. And we know the housing market is suffering 
And as Keith has often said, the housing market is the US economy and the housing market is slowing down. Thank you, Richard. Okay, on to a an occasional section which I hope not to have to repeat too often. Right, now last week we did a section on how the OECD nations had been spending 70% more this year on energy and, as most of that is imported, I did a section on how that would affect GDP. But, and this is embarrassing, I quoted the GDP formula for memory, and it turns out that I've had it wrong for the last 15 years. So this is the correct formula. Now, I thought it was C minus S plus I plus G plus X minus M. But actually, it's not. So I got all that wrong. So it is consumption plus investment plus G plus X minus M. So the savings actually is assumed in consumption, which makes sense. And I did actually check with my old LSE economics professor, and he couldn't really tell me where I'd got the the uh, formula from, because this is the correct formula. So the conclusions for last week don't really change. But the, please remember the formula, because this is the correct formula. I should also say that my discussion of the savings was confused because I talked about how there was a stock of excess savings which could be spent and that would support consumption. And, of course, GDP, the GDP formula is a flow calculation, and I was talking about the stock of savings turning into a flow anyway the bottom line is if we now re-examine the correct gdp formula we can say that because there has been an increase in imports which is minus m gdp will have to fall unless there's an offsetting increase in consumer expenditure which is unlikely as real wages have been falling Although we know that there are excess savings from the pandemic, which may be spent down to support consumption to an extent. An increase in investment is unlikely because the economy is slowing down. There may be a, an offsetting increase in government expenditure as the offsetting natural stabilizers come into effect, such as increased unemployment benefits, etc. And we know that the governments have committed to these energy subsidies. Um, but we also know there's been no increase in exports. So adding all that up, I still think that UK and European GDP have to fall because of this large increase in energy imports. Thank you very much to Mr. C. Peckham for getting in contact from via email and very politely putting me right on all of that. Thank you very much. The other thing that I should clarify from last week is that we talked about the capital cycle and I talked about a coming glut in shipping. What I should have made clear is that is a coming glut in container shipping. Other parts of the shipping industry will not be affected. So oil tankers, cruise liners, etc. Thank you to Richard B for getting in touch and pointing that out. Okay, on to one chart. And we always go on about the housing cycle, and this is why. So the housing index leads the unemployment rate. And we talked about this at some length a while ago, that the 
two main sectors of the economy which shed jobs are manufacturing and construction. And so as the housing index falls, so construction companies start to lay people off as their projects end and they don't start new ones. So you will see the housing index, and this is lit, um, brought forward by 10 months, leads the unemployment rate and that causes a recession. And as we know and are co have covered already in the weekly data, the housing market in the US is contracting hard and we've got a whole section on that later. So to summarize, once again, the housing cycle is the business cycle and the housing cycle in the US is falling. Okay, on to inflation watch, Richard. Thanks, Keith. So um, as Keith discussed, we've had a number of inflation figures coming through and you can take a look at this, but UK inflation is uh, looking as a standout worst case uh, uh, with our CPI 11.1%. Um, and uh, US is uh, falling, EU is falling, Germany is falling, Japan is still remarkably low, 3%. Mm. And uh, ours is rising and at 11.1% is the leader. Um, I guess one of the reasons the EU energy price, sorry, the EU inflation is falling is the energy price input component, but that is a guess. Mm, no, it will be because it, um, we know that energy prices have fallen sharply over the last month. We've had a, a mild winter, as we've had a mild start to the winter, I should say, yeah. but also the EU numbers are for November and we are awaiting the numbers for the UK and the US. Have the, you can see the UK food inflation there, and uh, food is the dark line, the dark bars, which is really very worrying. And obviously, it's going to significantly affect the poorest households. And EU inflation has broadened, which is bad news um, because it means it's likely to become more entrenched. In the weekly data we've just shown you, we've shown that. CPI fell in November, but that was because of energy largely. And so these all the lines on the left are core measures excluding food and energy. And what they're essentially showing is that inflationary pressures in the EU continue to build because just like everywhere else, you get this initial surge in inflation. And then people start demanding higher wages and you get this broad inflationary impulse that goes through the economy. And in the EU, it is still pushing through, essentially. Interesting, which suggests that we're not going to see a fall off in the EU inflation rate particularly quickly. Well, not until it goes into serious recession. And yeah. the thing about the EU is the interest rates are still extraordinarily low <clears throat> when you've got an uh, inflation's down this month but it's at 10 percent and interest rates in the eu are 1.25 percent he says from memory that's oh, no, and, and the eu actually can't afford to put interest rates up because yeah. if the peripheral interest rate goes up it bankrupts the peripheral economies i mean italy isn't actually a peripheral economy it's a major U eu economy yeah. So the EU is really, really stuck. So, and uh, the ECB is completely stuck in terms of what it does with interest rates. Yeah. So EU interest rates are 1.25%. Yeah. You know, negative 8.5%-ish. Uh, so this is US National uh, Rent Index month on month change. So you can see US rent rents are falling slightly. I mean, this chart is, the, the changes are small here. Mm. Inflation in the Eurozone appears to have peaked, but we need to pass that with the um, previous but one slide, which suggests actually the, the appearance is because of reduction in energy inflation and that other, other fa factors haven't peaked. Yeah. So, I mean, inflation in the Eurozone did fall in November. Core CPI was unchanged, but we've got some significant inflationary pressures still present. And as we've said, 
We have very low interest rates in Europe, which are not going to be suppressing the economy. So we don't really know where we are with Eurozone inflation. And the same is true of, EU, of UK inflation. But it looks like the US inflation is falling. Yeah. The US, of course, has lower energy price inflation than we do. Okay, on to recession watch. This is the global leading indicator, and it is super bad, frankly. It only ever reaches these levels in recessions, although there was a bad print in 2018, 2019. But this is not a good looking chart, and it suggests that we're going to move into a global recession. And this is the Philadelphia Fed Coincident Index, and it looks at the number of U.S. states that are co contracting. And when the number's above 50, that has always meant a recession. And we are now below 50. And I would also add that when it goes below 50, it tends to keep on falling. Now... We previously said that the, the pace of rate hikes this cycle are very fast. But actually, I didn't realize this. They have been much faster in the past. In 1980, they absolutely shot up, causing an enormous recession. I would uh, just comment on this, Keith, that the, um, this is an absolute measure. But of course, in relative terms, if you were to do this in relative terms, I suspect you'd find the current cycle was by far and away the leading one because interest rates in the US have gone up from what half a percent to four mm. percent so they've gone yes. up eight times eightfold yes that's very true Richard and also the the levels of absolute debt are massively higher now and so anyone who's on variable rates will be suffering as will anyone who needs to refinance their existing debt I think actually, I think this is an interesting chart because it it illustrates um, it illustrates the problem with looking at something in a very one economic factors in a very one dimensional manner. And yes, the, um, the the actual the absolute rate hike speed is not that great. But what really, to my mind, what really counts is is the um, is the relative rate hike mm. speed. And I noticed this is a Deutsche Bank asset allocation. And, um, you know, it makes you wonder, just makes me wonder how, how clued up. <laughs> the well, the trouble is, this chart really is. Well, the trouble is, you. Ma I mean, you make a really good point in that, you know, 1980, you know, probably the starting point of interest rates was probably like 8% or something. So you went from 8% to 20% over the course of, you know, six months, which is bad. But yeah. that's only a 50% rise. That's no, sorry, you're doubling. Yeah. So that's bad, but you're only doubling the uh, interest rate. Whereas here, we've started off at 0.25%. And then we're going up to what? By this cycle, five? You know, yeah. that is a huge increase relatively. But, you know, if you're going to do things relatively, I mean, in inter interest rates in the eurozone were minus 0 0.1. They've got, yeah. got to like one point two five calculation there. <laughs> exactly. How are you going to deal with that? So, I mean, I'll no graph would be one, perfect. <laughs> so this is showing that credit card spending has been falling into the Christmas period, uh, which is actually quite unusual and suggests slowdown uh, in the US economy again. Swedish retail sales. At their fastest pace ever. That's yeah. interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I thought this was very interesting. And the regional US Fed manufacturing surveys are all pointing to a slowdown. It's reinforcing what we've been saying. Three months change in US house prices, again, starting to continuing to confirm the slowdown in the US housing market. Yeah. So leading indicators are in, in our recession watch, the leading indicators are looking bad. And we do appear to be heading for a global recession. Thank you, Richard. On to European Energy Crisis Watch. Now, this is the latest forecast as of this morning for the Monday, the 12th of December. So in a week and a half's time. And you'll see cold weather is coming. So 
I didn't realize this, but cold houses kill people. And because people are going to be heating their houses less this winter, depending on the severity of the winter over the coming months, extra deaths of between 80 and 100,000 people are expected across Europe. So the energy crisis will have a death toll attached. I um, I don't wish to sound callous, but I'm always a bit dubious about excess deaths because, you know, to be brutally honest, excess deaths really mostly reside in the elderly. And it may be that they have died a little bit sooner than they otherwise would. I mean, I think if you talk about excess deaths in teenagers, that would be something seriously of serious concern. But um, excess deaths get bandied around rather a lot as being universally a bad thing rather than you know, part of life. Mm. Moving swiftly on, Richard. Feel free to cut that, Keith. <laughs> well, I'll, tell, I'll tell that with my size next time. <laughs> exactly. You are in a black shirt. Think of the, uh, think of the savings to the... Um, <laughs> you must cut that bit out. <laughs> I'll leave it in. <laughs> I'll go and edit it myself. <laughs> um, German electricity prices rose sharply this week as winter started to bite and temperatures fell. And it was even worse in the UK where electricity prices absolutely shot up. And if you look at the chart bottom right here, you can see why. Essentially, we had no wind and fog, so renewables collapsed. And so that meant we had to burn a lot more gas. Now, French electricity prices have not, pri have not spiked. And apparently, the French have instigated price controls. I don't really see how that is viable going forwards if they have to import electricity. Now, normally they're an exporter, mm. but we know they're going to have problems with their nuclear reactors. Let's see what happens. Italy, which normally imports a lot of electricity, including from France, their electricity prices spiked. So we know over the next few weeks, it's going to get cold watch this space we are not out of the woods yet by any measure now the ft had a special report on energy trading between nations in the eu and this chart shows interconnectors between the nations of europe there's generally a lot of electricity trading throughout europe in fact luxembourg imports almost all is at electricity as does lithuania and the exporters something you wouldn't expect bulgaria sweden norway we know exports a lot of hydroelectricity france germany and if we look at the sources of electricity well in norway it's hydro in france nuclear uk gas germany at the forefront of the Green Revolution, well, they burn a lot of coal. And we know that French nuclear reactor fleet is undergoing maintenance and not producing as much power as they normally do, and that is likely to continue. And so that means France has become a net importer of electricity. In Norway, there was a drought and reservoir levels are below normal still now norway have previously said that they would restrict electricity exports if the drought continued so is that enough to reduce that threat and this is the uk which has actually become a net exporter of electricity so we have a lot of LNG regasification plants and, and the export pipelines for gas are actually at full capacity. So what we have been doing is burning gas 
in our gas-fired power stations and exporting the electricity to the continent. But many of the exporting nations have warned that they may halt exports this winter if their own supplies are threatened. So Norway and Germany have both <laughs> explicitly said that. So the energy crisis will be a test of European cooperation. And if the exporters cut their exports, then some of these countries at the top here will suffer from power shortages, blackouts, etc. So in conclusion, well, let's see what happens. It's going to get cold in the next couple of weeks. And we sh gas storage is near capacity, but the extent of the crisis will always depend on the weather. We are not out of the woods yet, although the crisis has started well. OK, on to the Jerome Powell speech. Now, we've already talked about this um, earlier, but Jerome Powell's speech, which the market took incredibly well, he said that he would slow the pace of rate rises, but they were less concerned about the pace of rate rises than the terminal rate, i.e. how high rates go and how long they need to stay there to get inflation back under control. And he made it very clear that they were still very much committed to getting inflation under control. To quote, cutting rates is something we don't want to do soon. So that's why we are slowing down. So his fear was that if they raised rates too high, too fast, they would drive the economy into a recession and then have to cut rates. And by increasing rates at a at a slower pace, he reduced that risk. But he still expects rates to go higher and to have to stay there for longer. So he set three conditions that would need to be met before the Fed pivoted and started to cut rates. And they were that core goods prices would need to keep falling. And we know that goods inflation is come, coming down and you've seen the manufacturing PMIs, etc. Goods inflation looks likely to continue downwards. CPI and PCE housing inflation need to follow private rent indices down. And again, that is highly likely. We've seen rental inflation falling and now negative. And finally, X housing core service inflation needs to fall decisively. And that depends on creating some slack in the employment market. Now, the JOLTS job data this week were not terribly reassuring on that front. There is only a small drop in job openings. And that suggests that the Fed will need to keep on raising rates and keep them high until the JOLTS number and the employment numbers start to fall. Although, of course, we get the non-farm payrolls this afternoon. And also, Keith, as I said earlier, that, it, that they would like to increase the labor force participation rate. Mm, yes, very good. So this is core CPI, which seems to be forming a top, he says, hopefully. Um, this is US rent. All the measures are showing that rental inflation is coming down. Although, of course, PCE housing inflation is continuing to rise because, as we have covered many times, the Fed's housing component is based on a survey and is difficult and it lags, essentially, is what you really need to know. And these are spot container shipping rates and they are falling right back down which shows that supply chain pressures in the goods sector are falling and that should be good for goods inflation now we talk about high service inflation a lot of it this year has been driven by three sectors shelter which we know is lagging 
medical services, which is quirky and dependent on the annual update to health insurance costs and also transportation. So at the bottom of the chart, we have those in September and at the top, we have the same ones in October. And you'll see that medical services are now negative. Shelters should start to fall from now on as rental inflation is falling and transportation should also start to fall as we know that goods demand is falling and also hopefully gasoline prices start to fall with the falling oil price but the market loved the pal speech and the s p 500 shot up by three percent and as we've discussed earlier isn't that rather self-defeating in contrast the bond market was unmoved because they interpreted the speech as meaning that interest rates may not rise as quickly, but they are still going to go higher and stay there. So in summary, I thought the Powell speech changed very little. The Fed is still determined to raise rates until it hurts. That's it. And while we talk about interest rates, something that I was unaware of was that the San Francisco Fed produces the proxy funds rate. And it does so by looking at what the real rates are in the economy. Now, so if you think about the Fed funds rate, it is now between 3.75 and 4%. And that is used as a reference for all the actual interest rates in the economy, such as mortgage rates. We know mortgage rates are just below 7%, so at a substantial premium to the Fed fund rate. And what the proxy funds rate does is it measures all those real-world interest rates in the economy. So it shows how the Fed funds rate is affecting real-world monetary conditions. And once again, thank you to Mr. C. Peckham for sending me this and making me aware of it because it's very interesting. So this is from the San Francisco Fed website and it shows the proxy fund rates. And you see that it has risen a lot more than the Fed funds rate. So real world monetary conditions are tight. And if we look at it on a longer term basis you'll see that the proxy funds rate is now higher than it was pre-GFC and at a level that was last seen in 2000 and that the economy has not been able to live with for 20 years. And bear in mind, over those 20 years, the indebtedness of the US economy has massively expanded. So these rates a very contractionary. That's very interesting, Keith. So in summary, US monetary policy in the real world, in the market, is very tight. A recession's coming. And while we talk about the impacts of monetary policy, let's quickly recap over US housing. Richard, do you want to do these? Yeah, thank you, Keith. So the real house price index is uh, the highest it's ever been the house price to rent ratio is the highest it's ever been and house price to income ratio is um if i've got my colors right is about as high as it was at the time of the great financial crisis so even now this is at the uh, end of quarter two 2022 so we had a little bit of movement but you can see that if it were to revert to some form of mean which you look at maybe sort of between for the various lines between 60 and and 90 uh there's a long way for them to go and there's a lot of new housing supply that is under construction that was permitted and so forth at the time when we had this big housing boom post covid that is going to hit the market and the builders will be looking to gain to recoup the funds which uh from selling units which they may not be able to sell the builders will go bust they'll lay off millions of uh, people as keith suggested earlier and lo and behold 
you get a housing crash. Now, we don't mean we may not get a crash, but it is looking seriously toppy. And the housing price, housing prices are starting to fall. Look at the, the uh, growth between 2020, 2021 and 2022, and suddenly 2022 is dropping right back down. And I suspect it's going to start slicing through 2021 fairly shortly, uh, particularly when those housing units that are under construction hit the market. And talking of uh, relative versus absolute, housing mortgage payments are up over 40% for the buyer of the median home, bearing in mind that the US typically take out 30-year uh, debt. So 30-year debt will have um, not been issued at 0.25%, but it, the market will be reacting for interest rate rises that we've seen recently. So that reduces the affordability of house prices. So here's HEP pending sales down 35%. I mean, one suspects that if prices drop by 30% or 40%, pending sales might start to pick up. Uh, this is really an issue of affordability and concern about where the housing market is going. New listings of um, these are pre-owned homes. People are not selling. They decided to stay put. And uh, the supply available in the market is currently um, three and a half months. And so there is a build now, significant build in inventory. And that line looks fairly entrenched. And if it continues, then it's going to rise well above the uh, 2020 figure, which was the COVID figure of four and a half months. Yeah. Particularly, as we know, there's a lot of um, housing being built. Yeah, exactly. And homes are currently being sold in a median of 36 days which is a little bit longer than um if you look at the red line you can see that in may and june homes were being sold to medium median duration about 18 days which is really very very quick um mm. and now it's 36 days and uh and rising so another indication the housing market has significantly slowed and average homes sold for 98.5 percent of the final list price which is very you know one would expect in a normal market, in my experience, going back many years, that someone offers a house for sale at X. You put in an offer slightly below X or below X, and you agree to something just about a little bit below X. And um, the extraordinary situation has been a lot of houses recently have been selling at above mm -hmm. X, which is really quite bizarre to my mind. And now they're back to where I would say they might normally be, but they're certainly not back to where... Um, you would expect them to be in times of a severe housing crisis where they might be, people might be putting in silly offer like 75% of the asking price. Yeah. Whether we get there or not remains to be seen. The Home Diet by Demand Index has dropped from being above 2021 and 2022 significantly to now being below both of those and a 33% drop this year. So the housing market is slowing rapidly. We think it will continue to slow rapidly. It's uh, There's a lot of pending inventory sitting, wait being completed as we speak. And then we will start to see the shedding of jobs and the beginning of the recession in the US. Thank you, Richard. Now, <clears throat> a while ago, we did a section on the Fed balance sheet as a predictor of the S&P 500, and I showed you this chart. And so net liquidity, which is defined as the Fed balance sheet minus the Treasury general account and minus the reverse repo facility, and that's the green line, appear to have a very good correlation with the S&P 500. Now, before I get into this, a quick thank you to Uncool Tom on our Discord channel, who explained all this to me, and I think I now understand it. Hence, we're going through it again. Okay, so how do you define net liquidity? Remember that the Fed balance sheet comprises bonds that it has bought from institutions, giving them US dollar reserves in return. So one way of looking at the Fed balance sheet is that it represents money that has been made available to the financial system. The Treasury general account is 
money held at the Fed that belongs to the US government and is the result of bond sales. So it is money that is unavail currently unavailable to the economy because it is being held with the Fed for the government. So the TGA represents money withdrawn from the financial system. The reverse repo facility is money borrowed mainly from money market funds, not banks, as I'd previously said, on a short term basis using bonds as security. And once again, it represents money that has been withdrawn from the markets and therefore is unavailable for other purposes. So in summary, the balance sheet, Fed balance sheet equals money made available to the financial system. The TGA, TGA and RRP are money that has been withdrawn from the system. So therefore, net liquidity is the Fed balance sheet minus the TGA minus the reverse repo facility. So net liquidity will rise when the Fed's balance sheet is expanded by buying bonds in the market in exchange for reserves. The government spends the TGA, withdrawing money from the Fed and putting it into the economy. And the RRP is reduced as contracts expire and money is returned to money market funds and made available for use in the financial sector and the economy. So we see that there's an amazing correlation between net liquidity and the level of the S&P 500. And this is a chart from week 88 of Portfolio Matters, and it claims that there's an R squared of 89%, which is absolutely astonishing and means that 89% of the volatility of the S&P 500 can be explained by net liquidity. And if we believe that, that means that only liquidity matters, i.e. earnings don't matter, news barely matters, sentiment barely matters. The only thing that matters is that when the Fed either withdraws money from the financial system or pushes money into the financial system, that that always seems to end up in the equity market, changing the level of the equity market. So we did that two months ago. How has it performed? Well, over the last three weeks, net liquidity has risen. And that is despite a fall in the Fed balance sheet. And it is because of a decline in the reverse repo facility. As so money was returned to money market funds, who presumably put it in the stock market. And also the TGA fell as the government spent money that it pre previously raised from bond sales. So what happened? Well, as forecast by net liquidity, the S&P 500 rose. Now, there's also the question of causality. The data for Fed liquidity is weekly. And let's say that a money market fund decides it wants to buy equities and withdraws money from the reverse repo facility and then puts it into the equity market. You would see this correlation, but that correlation would be contemporaneous and have little predictive power. So in conclusion, this relationship seems to work. However, does it have any predictive power? In order to, to forecast the S&P 500 using this relationship, you need to forecast net liquidity. Now, the only one of those components which we can forecast with any accuracy is the Fed balance sheet, which we know 
should continue to contract through QT. So if this relationship holds, we would expect that the S&P 500 should fall, but with some volatility because we can't forecast either the RRP or the TGA. Some other charts, Richard. So this is this is a chart that shows Fed remittances to the Treasury, but we're not entirely sure what the uh, what the various contributions to this um, negative contribution that they're now making to the Treasury finances is made up of. And we've just had a discussion <laughs> offline, and um, maybe if anyone actually knows what the components of this are, it would be very useful to find out. Well. I think we could summarize our discussion in that I think the majority of these losses are caused by the fact that the, the Fed bought long term bonds using QE at yields of about 2% in return for reserves. So it's receiving 2% on the bonds it bought, but is now paying out 3.75% on the reserves. So it is losing money on the interest it has to pay on its balance sheet. And the other component is it bought those bonds expensive and it's now selling them cheap. So it'll also be losing money on the price of the bonds. Mm. So what is the mix between the two is the question. Yeah, so Credit Suisse is uh, not in a happy place, is it? They did a, a large uh, rights issue recently, didn't they, where the... Uh... I'm not sure what the, the ratio was, but share price took a, another pummeling as a consequence. I mean, the question has to be, is Credit Suisse actually going to go bust? Will it have to be nationalised by the Swiss government? Can the Swiss government afford to nationalise it? Because we don't know what its hidden liabilities are. I believe that the rights issue was four and a half billion euros. Is that right? It's absolutely enormous. And the share price <laughs> continues to drift off Yes. Do you remember the Bank of Scotland rights issues, rights issue that they did not law not long before they had to be bailed out? Yes. But we're expecting high interest rates to cause financial distress oh. and just waiting for the pennies to drop. Yes. As uh, we I think we talked about earlier, financial Blackstone has gated its hundred and twenty five billion dollar real estate investment trust following too many redemption requests. The problem with real estate investment trusts is that they are only liquid when the property market is doing well. Yeah. And private sector debt in Canada is now higher than in Japan at the peak of the Japanese asset bubble. That does not all go well. Yeah, we talk a lot about, you know, Europe, the UK and the US on this podcast. But, you know, we've had this global property bubble in which Canada and the Australia are actually possibly the worst. And we shouldn't forget that this is going to be a big global crisis. And this is a chart that shows we're doomed. Um, <laughs> and it's one of, one of Keith's more cheerful charts, um, and which is nice. And, uh, you know, we're doomed. We um, There's not much, if China don't control their emissions, there's not much the rest of us can do about it. Yeah. Okay, well, after that, good news. That was good news, Keith. <laughs> well, I thought I thought this is a great cartoon and something we should all bear in mind. <laughs> it's like when it, financial commentators, including us, <laughs> tend to see apocalypse all the time, but the world economy does survive and you know, we always come through recessions, although it may not seem like we're going to at times. And good news of the week. Well, we're always talking about how we're destroying life on this planet. Well, the Iberian lynx, in 2002, there were less than 100 of them. 20 years later, there are over 900. So, the population has grown ninefold in 20 years, thanks to um, conservation efforts. You know, if it carries on at that rate, there'll be, there'll be lynxes everywhere. So, but anyway, so conservation works. What's the plural of lynx, Rick, Keith? 
Yeah. Urban Fox, I think. <laughs> so moving on to um, our weekly checklist of equity markets. It was, um, and we're used to big movements in the equity markets, but these are perhaps more normal size movements. So the FTSE all shares really unchanged on the year. Stocks are pretty much unchanged on the week, but down 10% on the year. The S&P 500 actually was up only 1.2%. Because it was down at the start of the week, down 15, near 14.5% for the year. The NASDAQ up a bit, but down 26% for the year. Uh, Hang Seng up a lot, but down 20% for the year. And the topics pretty much unchanged on the year. Bitcoin had a slightly better week, but down 63% year to date. And uh, the pound continuing its rise upwards, up 1.5% on the week, and only down 9% for the year. Uh, and actually, the dollar is looking like it is falling, continuing to fall for a while. So maybe the pound ends the year less, down less than 9%. The euro performing similarly to the pound, or actually the pound-euro uh, exchange, very much um, as it was at the start of the year. Only a differential of about 1.5% there, despite the fact that one point the euro is significantly down again, uh, up against the pound. The dollar index... Only up 9% for the year now, and the VIX is continuing to um, to, sh to show uh, a low volatility, and um, the buy above 30, sell below 20 means that on that basis, the VIX, the S&P is still a, a sell in anticipation of the VIX rising. And I put that trade on last week after we did, did it. Did you? I, yeah. bought one, I bought one contract of the S&P. Uh, and uh, I'm down forty-five pounds. Well, well, good work, <laughs> Richard. But because the thing is, it didn't actually cost twenty last week. No, it, it cost didn't... twenty this week. And I just need to correct myself. I didn't buy one contract. I sold one contract for the S&P. Right. And I'm down forty-five pounds. Only about one pound of which was commission. So, um, but I'm just gonna. I'm, I just thought the thing, the the way to prove this one is to actually have some skin in the game so I've yeah. got a small amount no i'm going to have open a small spread bet after we get off this yeah just, just a, you know just for a bit of fun a bit of fun exactly yeah and it makes you look at it harder yeah so there we have the dollar index which is retraced like probably two fifths of where it came from at the start of this year yeah that's falling fast yep uh and uh it's, it's interesting, isn't it? They think the long dollar is the most crowded trade, which suggests the long dollar has somewhere further to, or the dollar has somewhere further to fall to. Yeah. Crowded trades unwind incredibly fast. Yeah. Painfully. Uh, there's the VIX. There you go, Richard. Crossed yesterday, actually. I bought it. I sold it too soon, Keith. I, I jumped yeah. the gun. Um, greed is back. Morgan Stanley have turned negative on the S&P 500. Uh, as a market sentiment indicator, which suggests that market sentiment is outside of those bounds on the yep. upside and therefore is too high. Actually, it's coincident with the VIX. Yeah. Investors have been accumulating cash since COVID. This is, just shows how people have how, how people have got their asset allocation. And forecast of earnings per share growth of 2.9% for 2023. I just think that's way, just way too high. Well, if we're going into a recession, if we're going into a recession, you would expect to have negative EPS growth, wouldn't you? Yeah. And CEO confidence, uh, what happens to earnings per share on the basis of correlated with CEO confidence with a 12-month gap? And uh, CEO confidence is plummeting, uh, which suggests that earnings per share is going to follow in fairly short order within the next few months. Yes. And the important point is, this is just not priced into the market. Yeah. And there we have it. It's rather a nice chart, isn't it? Key, it's key. You, you've drawn a nice line on there, Keith. Mm. I like that. <laughs> and it, you know, it's a big, broad, downward sloping channel. And it, yeah. it looks like it's sort of roughly hit the top of it. So um, it might poke through it, but it probably isn't going to, in mm. my view, it probably isn't going to go very much above that big red line that Keith has very accurately drawn. So, yeah, I'm going to put on a little 
negative spread bet for a bit of fun. We'll make a chartist of you yet, Keith. Yeah. Uh, margin debt is falling fast. That's just a good sign because margin mm-hmm. debt is always very dangerous. Yeah. Uh, this is Morgan Stanley, who obviously aren't amongst the um, the analysts who forecast uh, earnings per share growth of two two point nine percent for twenty twenty three, because they seem to be forecasting earnings per mm. share um, negative earnings per share growth. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. On to commodities and energy commodities. So. This week was fairly quiet week. Brent was up 0.9%, WTI up 2.5%. Cold weather in Europe caused a rise in gas prices, both in Holland and in the UK. In the US, natural gas prices actually fell by 7%, which is rather surprising. Coal followed European natural gas prices higher, up 10% on the week up 127% on the year. Uranium drifted off, down 1% on the week. Some numbers specific to the oil market. Now, last week, we reported a build in US crude inventories. Well, that unwound rather spectacularly this week when there was a drawdown of 10.1 million barrels, including the SPR, excluding the SPR, It was still an enormous 8.8 million barrels. So this week, the US was very much undersupplied. Um, US crude oil production was stable at 12.1 million barrels, and we haven't yet had an update on the Big Hughes rig count. So this is Brent, which has been drifting off now for a few months. Mm. And... This chart from the FT shows what the destinations of Russian crude shipments. You'll see that actually, despite all the EU's protestations, it is still a big importer of Russian crude, although India and Turkey have massively increased their imports as Europe has reduced theirs. And if we look at the returns of American energy stocks, there's a real divergence between the performance of energy companies and crude. So over the last few months, energy stocks have shot up while crude's drifted off. Now, some re-rating was necessary, but this looks unsustainable and I thought this was very interesting. Hedge funds are actually short the energy sector. So they don't think that oil prices are sustainable, presumably. Okay, on to natural gas. So we had a tick up in Dutch natural gas futures this week. UK natural gas futures also rose. In the US, they drifted off. Coal had a bounce. Uranium, is that drifting down? Was that stable? Industrial commodities, Richard. Uh, so if you look at the um, the industrial metals generally, aluminium up five, copper up four, iron ore up six, nickel up six, uh, tin up four, zinc up uh, 5.5. They all had a, a good week, presumably, um, amidst hopes that the US is going to avoid a recession. Um, I would guess that's what's happened there. Um, and uh, you know our views on that. Uh, lithium was just down a little bit, 2% on the week. I should also say that we appear to have lost our price source for chromium. We will see whether it comes back, but otherwise, I'm afraid we may have to remove it. So, um, oh, of course, of course, the other news was that China might be stopping its lockdowns um, and that would um, possibly facilitate a rise in industrial metal demand. Um, although if it stops its lockdowns, presumably it's going to have a lot of very ill older people because its vaccine doesn't work. Um, we shall see, really. Um, I don't think it's going to... I don't think China is going to suffer from a, a political crisis because I think that uh, the Chinese military will be brought in to control any protests if they get too vociferous. Mm. Uh, 
Um, so China's share of global demand in um, property and construction is enormous. The Chinese property share of China metal demand is very significant. And we know the Chinese property sector is in some trouble, although it's being sort of partly bailed out by the Chinese government. I think there's a lot of moving parts here and it's very difficult to know where these industrial commodities will go in the short term. We have aluminium, cobalt, copper, chromium, which we haven't got the data for, iron ore, lithium, neodymium, nickel, tin, so all these metal commodities showing a, a reasonable run up in the mm. last four or five weeks, ferrovanadium, uh, zinc. Yeah, surprising rise in all the industrial commodities actually over the last month. Yeah. I'm moving on to precious metals. Uh, they had a good week. Gold up 3%, silver up 6 platinum up 55 and palladium up 2 only rhodium didn't move. And actually, the year-to-date changes for silver and gold pretty much flat, almost flat on the year. So uh, that's a little bit different to how we have been seeing it over the last few months. Mm. There we have gold and silver, platinum, rhodium, palladium. Although, as you always say, Richard, the gold in these charts is priced in US dollars and the dollar is falling. Yeah. So in sterling, it would be more stable. Okay, on to rates. So... Despite all the indications that inflation may be peaking, UK yields rose across the curve this week. So at the short end, the two-year rose by one and a half basis points. At the long end, they rose by eight. And in the eurozone, we had a divergence. So Greek 10 years fell by 21 basis points this week, whereas Italian 10 years rose by four basis points. But these are not very worrying levels. These are not these levels do not indicate investor concern. So there is currently little indication of return of the Eurozone crisis. But as we go into winter, that may all change. Now, this is market expectations for <clears throat> U.S. interest rates. And what's interesting is they're expecting high rates for years to come, according to this. And we look at changes in the Fed funds expectations. The red dotted line is current pricing. So expecting rates to fall in 23-24 but then flatten out at quite a high level. I don't think that's true. I think it's going to come right back down as the US goes into quite a hard recession. What's interesting, Keith, is virtually none of these dot plots actually reflect what's happened in, in any way. Yeah. Now, I thought this was really interesting. This is foreign holdings of US treasuries, and the blue line is China. The orange line is us, the UK. We're doing the US a favor. Don't There's know. a bit pro quo in there. Yeah. Or it's Brits fleeing the UK for a hard currency. <laughs> who would do a thing like that, Keith? Yeah, exactly. We don't know anyone to do that. God, no. Now, this is also not what you might have expected. So, this is foreign net purchases of US financial assets. The Yellow line is equities. The blue line is treasuries. So foreigners have been net buyers of U.S. bonds in well, actually recent months, but also generally this year, and they've been selling equities. Now, UK ten year is up on the week, but actually that the downwards trend is still very much intact. Thirty year appears to have stalled a bit. U.S. ten year drifting off. 
and it's approaching a technical test. Will it burst through on the downside and confirm a downtrend? This is the German 10-year drifting off, Italian, Greek, and finally seasonality chart, which is, you know, December, fairly quiet month in a yeah. bear market. And no change to our views on various asset classes. And finally, concluding comments. Well, Jerome Powell's speech seems to have inspired rallies in all the asset classes. Although reading the text, it is clear the Fed intends to continue raising rates and keep them high until inflation comes under control. So I see no sound basis for the rally in equities. As all the data continues to point to a recession in 2023, and we've been through lots of PMIs, etc. this week, they're all pointing downwards. Richard, what have you been up to this week? Well, I had a reasonably decent week on the back of the rise in the uh, price of gold and silver. Now, silver, as we saw, is up uh, up this week about 6%. So um, a uh, significant positive change even when converted into, into pounds. And um, the, uh, the main contributor to my rise is my investments in the um, precious metal shares and of course most of those are actually denominated in either US dollars or Canadian dollars and mm -hmm. um, therefore and the share price of these companies tends to reflect the dollar price of precious metals not the pound price, price of precious metals so I only bought one uh, share so I'm, I'm still pretty inactive I bought a little bit of Fortuna Silver so this is the um, share price chart for Fortuna Silver Mines. And you can see it's just broken out of the uh, that channel that it's been in since early 2021 and uh, where it has dropped from about um, $10, $10 a share to $2 a share. So, you know, 80% drop. And the question is, in my mind, is this genuinely a, a breakout of the channel? Because depending on where you do your uh lower highs and lower lows this is a lower low here uh is this a higher high or is it a lower <laughs> high depends whether you consider that to be the last high or that to be the last high so i'm cautious but i do think that the precious metals market is actually starting to look like it is beginning to move in the direction i want it to move in so um what else I've done? So Ferro Alloy Resources, the eagle-eyed amongst you, Keith and I watched this year, we've noticed that it's actually bounced really quite hard the last couple of days this week. And um, it was up 12% this morning when I did this chart. But look how it's still well within this downtrend. And I wouldn't personally be tempted to buy it until it breaks out above this downtrend. And then mm. I might be tempted to have a little go at it. But I'm just, you see how it's had these big green candles, but it's also fallen back down here and here so i think you have to be quite careful of this one and also i've noticed there doesn't seem to be any news announcement on it yeah uh, the thing think is richard you know that we're going into a bear market and illiquid small illiquid companies that need to raise cash to keep going they yeah. their share prices can get absolutely hammered because yeah. there's a lot and particularly when there's a lack of liquidity and i fully intend to buy back in but I intend to do that when the blood is on the streets. Yeah, I think that's very sound advice, Keith. And we'll just keep an eye on it. Um, so this is a junior silver ETF, uh, which is looking a little bit like the Fortuna Silver Mines chart. So we've got the lower highs and we've got the lower lows. And this is currently a lower high. So if it doesn't break out from here, uh, all bets are off for sil small silver miners. So again, I'm watching it very carefully. But they've had a nice, you know, a nice little run up within the context of where they have been over the last few weeks. So that's spot gold. It's in its downtrend here, fell through that, and then it's poked itself above here. Question is, is it going to continue to rise towards this line here or not? Again, just having a keeping an eye on it. And um, 
That's me, Keith. How did you do this? What was your week like? Well, I'm afraid I had the opposite of you. I had a shit week. Down 2%. Very frustrating. Still having a good year. So, you know, I can't really complain, frankly. Um, And in retrospect, I got a bit carried away last week. And I bought too much of, in particular, the index link gilt. And I decided, as it drifted off, to trim the position by a third. So I did. And I made no other trades. I'm still, this is my allocation before I did that trade. And then I was then 60% in long bonds. And I'm now about 50. So, you know, still very exposed. Um, This is the US Treasury 20 year plus ETF. (laughs) which seems to be drifting up. Of course, the US dollar is a headwind. Now, they do, iShares do do a sterling hedged ETF, but for some reason, I can't trade it via my Barclays account. So I'm in the unhedged and I would prefer to be in the hedged. But, you know, what can you do? Now, this is 2071 gilt, and the reason I've had a bad week is its price drifted off. And last week, I was getting all excited because it seemed to be an upward trend, and I succumbed to greed. Mm. And never ends well. So, essentially, I bought some at 120. I was buying it throughout this period, and it's drifted off, and I thought... Actually, one thing you know is that all these shenanigans down here were caused by pension fund selling. And I didn't really understand why this was selling off while inflation was falling. And I thought the one thing I've learned, one of the things I've learned over the course this year is that when you're playing a trend, what I have done previously is that I have averaged into it. But, and that works. But what I haven't done is when it starts going against me, I haven't averaged out. And in several cases, this has caught me out when actually it starts to drift off and then the trend goes really against me, but I bought into it it on the upswing and then I haven't averaged down on the downswing. And the net result is not good so i thought well actually i'm going to average out and then average back in again so i've crystallized some losses and is that turning in the medium term i am fully committed to this trade so you never get the timing right you know and i'm still got a big exposure to this and you know the upside if we get to 200 is absolutely bloody enormous so you know Okay, that is it for the week. And a bit of housekeeping. Next week, I will be seeing the World Cup in Qatar. So there will be no Portfolio Matters on Friday. I will try and put something out quickly on Monday. And we are now going to go into a disrupted holiday schedule. So Merry Christmas to everyone. Indeed. And... uh... We hope that uh, we hope we see you uh, for our drinks, but also uh, one or two more podcasts, at least one before Christmas. But um, as yeah. he says, it will be a little bit disruptive from this point forward. Absolutely. Um, we'll try and keep you updated, but full service won't resume until after the holiday period. We'll be putting out a few holiday specials and things, hopefully in the meantime. But um thank you all for watching through to the end please can you press like and subscribe to the channel and in the meantime it's goodbye from richard wheater and it's goodbye from keith jordan and enjoy the world cup Keith. yeah thank you very much mate goodbye bye full disclaimer the material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal, or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. 
Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages, or for any results obtained from use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.